Pokemon's fifth generation is famously known as one of the most divisive, or at least it was at the time. These days, people really like the Unova games, and lately, there's been a lot of talk about us possibly going back to Unova in a new game that could be coming out soon, so it only makes sense to continue our series on Pokemon secrets you may not know about with the Unova games now. So let's go ahead and check it out. Pokemon secrets are a lot of fun, but today's secrets simply would not have happened without the support in part from today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club that delivers a box of awesome to your door every month that is full of really high quality items from small businesses and under the radar brands. For example, I just got their Weekender box, which features this travel bag, and this thing is amazing. I'm honestly blown away by the style and especially the quality of it. I also love their On Tap box that comes with this insulated growler simply because the quality is just that good, and it also comes with two stainless steel cups as well. It's also free to join, and you start with a preference quiz to get an idea of what kinds of stuff you want to receive, but you can always skip a month if you need to, and you can always preview what box you get each month to see if you want to keep it, swap it for something else, or just skip it entirely so you're only getting stuff you actually want. Additionally, every box of awesome has around $70 worth of goods inside, but costs you only a fraction of the value, and 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based right here in the US. So if you want to get your hands on some high quality goods that are going to up your everyday life experience, use my link in the description, bespokepost.com slash hiphop20, and use code hiphop20 at checkout to get 20% off your first first box of awesome, and a big thank you to Bespoke Post once again for supporting the channel. Why don't we go ahead and begin with the box art legendaries of Pokemon Black and White, Reshiram and Zekrom. The initial drafts of these legendary Pokemon's designs were created by artist Kiko Moritsugu, and she has made some interesting comments about their creation. Moritsugu has said that of her drafts that she created for these Pokemon, Reshiram's final design ended up being significantly different to what she had created. She has also said that Zekrom's design is mostly the same, which naturally makes you wonder what that original design of Reshiram could actually look like. However, that's not to say that Zekrom's design didn't go through some changes of its own. According to the game's director, Junichi Masuda, in an interview with German website Bisa fans, Masuda revealed that the plan for Zekrom's design was for it to have four hands. However, this was obviously changed, and we ended up with two-handed Zekrom instead. Another neat detail about Zekrom is how details about it were accidentally revealed early. Back in 2010, when Zekrom and Reshiram had been revealed, but no other details had really been specified about them, Shoko Nakagawa, who has worked as a voice actress for the Pokemon anime and has also been the host of some Japanese Pokemon TV shows, wrote a post on her blog about a character she had voiced, Peg from Zoroark, Master of Illusions, and how she loves Electric-type Pokemon, and therefore wanted to capture a Zekrom. At this time, Zekrom's electric dragon typing had not yet been revealed, making this an accidental leak from someone directly involved with Pokemon itself. As such, this utterance was quickly taken off of her blog shortly thereafter. Another major character from Black and White is, of course, their main villain, Getsis. Getsis is notable for many reasons, one of which being the eye patch that he has covering one of his eyes. Well, in some early concept art for Getsis, he actually can be seen without this eye patch, and a large scar can be seen surrounding his right eye. 
In fact, Getsus's entire right side of his body is rather curious, as many fans have pointed out that he also always has his right arm concealed beneath his cloak as well, and the one time we actually do get to see it in Black and White's opening cinematic, it is revealed to be completely black, and appears deformed. There are even more deformities going on with Getsus's right side, though, that many people probably haven't noticed, as if you look closely in his Versus sprites, and then even in Ultra Sun and Moon when he is given a 3D model, the right side of Getsus's mouth can be seen drooping a bit as well, which pretty much seals the deal that the right side of his body was somehow horrifically attacked before the event of Pokemon Black and White. Meanwhile, everyone's new favorite Unova character, Ingo, has something interesting about him as well. He is, of course, most well known for being surprisingly present in the Sinnoh-focused Pokemon Legends Arceus, and the likely reason for his inclusion here is pretty neat. Ingo's name is Nobori in Japanese, which is similar to the Japanese term Yama Nobori, which means mountain climbing. This similarity is most likely why Ingo was brought in to be the Warden of Sneasler, who grants you the ability of climbing in the game. Another cool fact concerning a Unova character's name has to do with Unova's champion, Alder. Alder is named after the Alder Moth, which is a pretty straightforward connection since Alder specializes in bug types, and his signature Pokemon, Volcarona, is also a moth. However, the connections go even deeper here, as the Alder Moth very noticeably sports a black and white color scheme, which could have had something to do with this naming choice as well, since Alder of course appears in the black and white games. There aren't just neat background facts having to do with black and white though, there are also plenty of cool in-game facts as well. In Pokemon Black and White 2, at the Celestial Tower, you can encounter a school kid here known as Alberta, who uses a single Litwick. After you defeat her, she will actually leave the tower and reappear at the Pokemon Center in Mistralton City, saying that she feels a little burned out from the battle. While sounding innocent enough, this is most likely a morbid reference to the Pokemon she uses, Litwick, and how it is said to absorb the life energy of people. Speaking of Mistralton City, this is also where you can find the gym leader, Skyla. In Pokemon Black and White 2, a neat little detail about her that could be a coincidence but is probably intentional is that all of her Pokemon's names start with the letter S, just like hers. She uses a Swoobat, a Skarmory, and a Swanna. And what makes this more likely that it's intentional is if you battle her in challenge mode, she adds a Pokemon to her team, and this Pokemon, Sigalith, also has a name that starts with the letter S. And since we're on the subject of names, let's keep that going with a couple other cool name facts. It was revealed by series art director Ken Sugimori in an interview on Nintendo's official Japanese website that Oshawott originally had a different name. It is known as Mijumaru in Japanese, but according to Sugimori, was originally going to be named Rakomaru at one point instead. Oshawott isn't the only one who had a beta name though, as Frillish also did as well. Frillish's Japanese name is Pururil but the cover of a Japanese script for the anime episode, A Rival Battle for Club Champ, which features the debut of Frillish, lists Frillish's name as Purunsu instead. Considering that their names are a massive part of each Pokemon's identity, it's interesting to think about how there's probably a good number of them who were known by a completely different name at some point in their development. Another cool fact about Frillish and its evolution Jellicent is that they were originally pure water type, and weren't designed as ghost type Pokemon. 
This is according to Ken Sugimori in an interview with Nintendo Dream Magazine, which was translated by Pokemon and video game historian Dr. Lava. Sugimori says that the ghost type was added for balancing purposes, and that Frillish's designer was actually disappointed that it ended up becoming a more scary Pokemon. You know, while we're on the subject of Unova Pokemon in particular, let's talk about some of them, because they get hated on a lot, but there's actually a lot of cool stuff about them, too. One cool Pokemon in particular, who has also been hated on a lot, is Vanillite and its evolutionary family. A lot of people hate the idea of an ice cream Pokemon for some reason, but these three were most likely created in the first place because soft serve ice cream, which Vanillite is, was invented in New York, which is the basis for the Unova region. Obviously, most people don't look into the background of Pokemon like that, but I personally think that that's really cool and gives a lot more validity and coolness to Vanillite and the rest of its line. A line of Unova Pokemon that I personally despise is the Lillipup family. Mostly just herdier though, and even I can admit that it's cool that they were included in the Unova decks for this reason. They are based on Yorkshire Terriers, a breed of dog that originates from Yorkshire, England, which, along with the city of York, obviously shares its name with New York and is partially where the New York name comes from. So it is beyond fitting for these Pokemon to be in Unova and even if their designs are kind of bland in my opinion, it does make them a little bit cooler. Another Unova Pokemon that I personally have never really been fond of is Lipard, but I have something cool to say about it as well. Lipard could possibly be partially based on the phrase, a leopard can't change its spots, as not only is it a leopard Pokemon, but this could also refer to it as the bad-natured, thieving type of Pokemon that it is. Let's move on to some talk about towns now, and the first town that I want to focus on is Aspersia City. In some concept art of Aspersia City, the layout of the town is significantly different to how it is in the final games, possibly indicating that Aspersia City went through some rearranging before it became the way we know it today. Opelucid City is also another important city in the Unova games, and whether or not this particular secret actually pans out is yet to be seen, but it is very noteworthy at the moment, so it's worth pointing out. As I mentioned in a previous video, Opelucid City is different between black version and white version, and has a futuristic theme in black, but a past theme in white. This concept of future and past being split between versions is identical to what we see in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, and among many, many other things, could be indicative of a new Unova game coming soon that could sort of act as a follow-up to Scarlet and Violet. So we will have to keep a close eye on that, and if you want a more in-depth explanation on that topic, be sure to check out this video right here. And while not quite about the city as a whole, we are next going to travel to Nimbasa City for a cool fact about the Nimbasa Gym. In black and white, this is the only gym where the gym leader gives less prize money upon defeating them than any of the other gym trainers in the gym do. This is due to the fact that all of the gym trainers here in black and white are rich boys and ladies, who give out more prize money than usual upon being defeated. Speaking of money, it is a large part of the theme of the character Grimsley, as he is heavily focused around a theme of gambling. This is cool and all, but it's also especially ironic considering that he debuted in Gen 5, which is the exact same generation when all gambling elements were officially wiped out of Pokemon games entirely, and the Game Corner in particular ceased to exist. 
Considering this, it could also be possible that Grimsley is a sort of ode to the game corners that was included upon their removal, since they were a pretty iconic and beloved part of the games up until that point. On the topic of character designs, let's go ahead and now talk about Bianca, Charon, and N. Bianca and Charon are your two rivals in black and white, with N, even though he's part of Team Plasma, essentially being an honorary third rival, as you battle him throughout the game very similarly to a traditional rival. With this in mind, it's actually kind of amazing that these three characters represent the three main themes of the games, that being truth, which is represented by Bianca, and how she has to face the truth that she isn't as strong as you or Charon, ideals, which is represented by Charon, who pursues the ideal of becoming the strongest trainer possible, and balance, which is represented by N, as he fights with himself throughout the game to discover what is ultimately the right path, only to find that a balance of both truth and ideals is the best way to move forward. This is also represented in these characters' names, as Bianca's name is derived from the color white, Charon's from the color black, representing the separate themes that these characters emulate, and N's name, or rather his full name, Natural Harmonia Gropius, represents the harmony of both of them coming together that he ultimately comes to emulate as well. It's even possible that the Unova region itself represents this theme. Not only is it based on an area of the United States, which has many different cultures and ideas coming together as one, especially in New York City, but the many bridges that are seen throughout the Unova region could very possibly be meant as a bit of symbolism as well, representing the need for a bridge between the concepts of truth and ideals, which is the ultimate message of the games. As beautifully as black and white were put together though, even they couldn't avoid their own fair share of mistakes. There are a number of errors in the black and white games involving the game's sprites, such as Slowpoke's battle sprite literally missing an entire eye on its tail, Marowak holding a bone in its right hand in its versus sprite, but in its left hand in its back sprite, which technically still works, but you get the idea. Weezing's design is actually significantly off as well, as the third segment of its body sits above its head and not below it like it's supposed to. And then, the entire Clink family also have their gears in the wrong positions in their back sprites relative to their front sprites, as their bodies are simply flipped the other way as if they were turned upside down instead of properly being rotated around to reflect the way they are facing. Wrapping back around to the Elite Four for a second, an interesting little anecdote about them is that when you enter each of their rooms to challenge them, the spiral staircases that you have to climb to reach them are different and matching depending on whether the Elite Four member is a boy or a girl. For the boys, the spiral staircases make two full complete turns, while the girls' staircases make one. Next, we come to why Unova was actually based on New York in the first place. While there are multiple reasons for this naturally, the director of the games, Junichi Masuda, revealed in an Awata Asks interview that the New York setting was inspired by the fact that he thought it would make a good location for a Pokemon music concert. When asked why Unova was inspired by New York, Masuda said, mostly because I strongly wanted to make a big change. Also, I once had my music arranged and had it performed in Pokemon concerts. I had concerts held in the Kanto region, Kansai region, Kyushu region, and Hokkaido prefecture in Japan to represent the regions in the Pokemon games, and when I thought about where I would like to hold another one if we could ever do it once more, I thought New York would be good because there are lots of famous theaters for musicals and opera in Manhattan. That is kind of a random point of inspiration for a Pokemon region if you ask me, but according to Masuda, it did play a factor in Unova's inspiration. 
On a different note, however, but also according to Masuda, Haxorus was the first Pokemon that was ever designed for Pokemon Black and White and according to Ken Sugimori, was designed while Pokemon Platinum was in development. When you think about it, this kind of development cycle makes all the sense in the world, but I personally find it extremely fascinating to hear how a Gen 5 Pokemon was being designed while they were still working on the Gen 4 game. It's just the kind of thing that kind of lets your imagination loose when thinking about what they're actually working on over at Game Freak at any given time. And with that, those were some secrets that you might not have known about the Unova games. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like, let me know all your thoughts in the comments below, and subscribe if you're new for more Pokemon content. You can also further support the channel if you would like as well by checking out my Pokemon remixes on Spotify or wherever you get your music. Because listening in any one of those places directly and immensely supports the channel, so check it out if you haven't already as it's extremely appreciated. With that said, I will be back very soon with another new video, and until then, as always, thank you guys so much for watching this one, I really appreciate it. And I will smell you guys later.